Hi guys, welcome back to Wild Side Wednesdays. This is Erin, and this week we're going to be talking about sharks. One of my favorite topics to talk about um, what they are, why they're important, and why you shouldn't be afraid of them. So what exactly are sharks? So sharks are a cartilaginous fish, so instead of bone, their skeleton is made up of cartilage. Uh, sharks fall under the class chondrichthys, which also includes the rays and skates. There are about 500 species of shark worldwide. Uh, we see about 40 of those species here in Hawaii, um, in our coral reefs, in offshore and uh, nearshore waters. Sharks are jawed vertebrates that have five to seven pairs of gills, and they have uh, dermal denticles instead of the typical fish scales that you think of, and we'll talk a little bit more about those dermal denticles. Sharks have a number of specialized adaptations that have made them become really successful top predators in the ocean and honestly just really, really cool animals. So like I said, we're going to talk a little bit about those dermal denticles. So um, you might hear them called placoid scales and this is what makes up the shark's skin. And what dermal denticles uh, actually means is tiny skin teeth. So they're basically like little teeny tiny microscopic um, teeth-like structures. If you've ever been to an aquarium or something and had a chance to pet a shark, you might have noticed that if you um, run your hand down its body from head to tail, it's smooth, and if you were to run your hand backwards, uh, it feels more like sandpaper, and that's because of these backward-facing dermal denticles that make up the shark's skin. These dermal denticles are really, really efficient at reducing drag as the uh, shark is swimming through the water. Um, Olympic swimmers actually came up with a fabric that was based off of these dermal denticles, and that was actually um, banned after the 2008 Olympics because it was too good. It was too efficient. It was, they thought it was kind of like cheating. Different species of sharks will have uh, differently shaped dermal denticles based on uh, maybe prey, where they're foraging, if they're bottom feeders like nurse sharks, or if they're open ocean like great whites, or if they're really, really fast like um, makos or thresher sharks. So I mentioned that these dermal denticles are tiny skin teeth. So the teeth in their mouth are basically just enlarged dermal denticles. And again, the shape and size can vary between species. So um, a nurse shark that feeds on the bottom of the sea floor would have more flat uh, crushing teeth for eating things like conch and lobster. And a great white would have more pointed serrated teeth uh, for catching larger, faster prey like seals in the open ocean. So sharks are constantly replacing these teeth, um, kind of like a conveyor belt. They'll have several rows of teeth in their mouth at one time, and on any given day they might have 50 teeth in their working row, and there might be up to 300 teeth kind of in production behind that. Um, these guys lose their teeth about every two weeks. They can be replaced, and some sharks may lose up to 50,000 teeth in their lifetime. So next time you find a shark tooth at the beach or in the water, uh, take a good look at that tooth and see the way it's shaped. Is it serrated? Is it pointy? Is it flat? And maybe just think about uh, what sh which type of shark that tooth may have come from. So sharks have also developed some really um, fascinating and acute and highly sensitive senses. So they do have the same five senses as we do. They have sight, smell, taste, touch, and hearing. Um, they use smell quite a bit. About two-thirds of the weight of their brain is dedicated to olfactory senses. But sharks do get a couple of bonus senses, one of those being electroreception, which is basically just the ability to delect, uh, detect electrical currents in the water uh, given off by muscles of fish or whatever else is in the water. Um, and these are called ampullae of Lorenzini, named after Stefano Lorenzini, who uh, kind of first described these 
uh, structures in the 1600s. Uh, but basically, they are jelly-filled pores, mostly concentrated in the head or the snout of the shark, and they will absorb and detect those electrical currents put out by the muscles of other animals or the heart of other animals, and um, they can retain that information with those jelly-filled pores. They also have uh, specialized pressure sensors in their lateral line, which is a line on the side of the body starting um, at the head, going down to the tail, and this is just kind of another set of jelly-filled pores uh, that work in a little bit different way. Instead of picking up electrical currents, uh, they're going to be, te be detecting pressure changes in the water around the animal. These pressure changes could be from uh, something swimming by or changes in currents, things like that. And um, these pressure changes can give the shark spatial awareness. Uh, they can use them to navigate and um, to detect prey and become aware of predators. So a little bit about reproduction in sharks. This is a really important topic uh, because these animals are actually very slow to mature and uh, to reproduce. Um, Greenland sharks, one individual has actually been found to live to about 400 years old and we think those that species doesn't mature until about 150 years old, and that is on the extreme side. But in general, these animals are very slow growing and late to mature. Sharks have three modes of having their babies, one of them being oviparity, which is laying eggs, uh, like the swell shark or the zebra shark. You may have heard of mermaid purses. Um, these can be different shapes and sizes depending on the species, uh, but these come from skates and sharks that uh, do this oviparity mode of having offspring. Another mode is ovoviviparity, which is when the um, egg casings basically hatch inside of the mother. Uh, whale sharks do this. There is still no maternal care, so they will, the egg casings will hatch inside the mother and then they will have live birth, but there's no maternal care or anything like that. Another mode of reproduction they have is viviparity, which is actually the same as us, the same as mammals, and this does involve live birth and an um, umbilical cord. Some examples of sharks that uh, display this viviparity mode of reproduction are um, hammerhead sharks and blue sharks. So how do sharks breathe? I mentioned earlier that um, depending on the species of shark, they can have anywhere from five to seven pairs of gills on the side of their head. And what they do with these gills is move oxy oxygen rich water over the gills and filter out that oxygen. Shark species have a couple of ways of doing this. Most shark spe species and the most primitive method of breathing is called ram ventilation. And uh, this is why a lot of sharks cannot actually stop swimming. They have to constantly be swimming to be moving that oxygen rich water over their gills so they can essentially breathe. Uh, however, uh, more recently in evolutionary history, um, they have developed a, another method of breathing called buccal pumping, which is where they can stop swimming, sit on the seafloor, open their mouth, and kind of use it like a vacuum to move that ox oxygen-rich water over their gills. Um, not as many species do this. The only species um, that we see here in Hawaii that does buccal pumping is actually the white tip reef shark, and uh, that's the most common shark you would see out here on a coral reef as well. So most sharks are cold-blooded animals. This means that their body temperature is controlled um, by the environment around them, but there are a few exceptions to that, uh, like your white sharks, which are actually warm-blooded to an extent. Uh, they use a counter-current heat exchange system in their body called the uh, Rite Mirable. 
So they are actually able to uh, control their own body temperature and that might be why we see great white sharks in cold waters and in warm waters as well because they have a little bit more control. So sharks are really important here in Hawaii, not just uh, for their ecological purpose, but also uh, for the culture of Hawaiian people. So sharks are um, an animal that is considered to be an amakua, which we've probably talked about before. And this is basically a family's spirit animal. So it's really important to respect sharks uh, while you're out here on the islands for many reasons, including that uh, Amakua status in some of these species. We have about 40 different species of sharks out here in the Hawaiian Islands, including the white tip reef sharks, black tip reef sharks, tiger sharks, scalloped hammerheads, and sometimes even great white sharks. Some studies have shown that scalloped hammerhead sharks uh, often use uh, Hilo Bay, Kaneohe Bay, and Waimea Bay as important pupping grounds. And also, tiger sharks um, often come down from the northwestern Hawaiian Islands down to the main Hawaiian Islands to have their pups. We've also tracked great, great white sharks uh, coming back and forth from California. So a lot of movement within these different species, especially those larger species. The most common species you would see out here um, on a trip or if you're snorkeling on a coral reef are those white tip reef sharks that are oftentimes resting on the seafloor um, under ledges or in caves or something like that. So sharks do play a really important um, part in keeping an ecosystem, a reef, healthy. Uh, they are apex predators, so basically everything they do affects everything underneath them in the food chain. Uh, they kind of keep the reef clean. So for example, if sharks were to disappear from a reef, uh, smaller predators that they would be eating, like jacks, um, might get out of control and be eating more of the herbivorous fish, like um, butterfly fish and parrot fish that are keeping the reef clean. Um, fish like those small reef fish, those really pretty colorful ones that we all love to see, um, are the ones that are eating algae and things off of the coral reef. And if they're not doing that anymore, then that algae could uh, overgrow the coral and possibly lead to coral disease or even coral death. And also, if there's less, less of those beautiful, colorful reef fish, then that would heavily affect the tourism industry uh, because those are things that people really love to go see when they're out here snorkeling. So this has led to sharks also being really important economically, um, helping, keep, helping to keep that uh, reef ecosystem in balance and also for... Uh, shark tours. A lot of people like to come out and specifically go on a boat that takes you to see sharks. One of the biggest threats of sharks today is overfishing, either due to bycatch, which is um, somebody fishing for something else and accidentally catching and killing sharks, and also for shark Finning. So shark fin soup is a really popular delicacy in some countries and this has led to people going out, catching sharks, just taking their fins and leaving the rest um, of the animal in the ocean. While shark finning has been a real booming industry in the past and still unfortunately is in the present, a lot of people around the world are recognizing and realizing that sharks are also very important economically uh, through a tourism and an ecotourism aspect. Another threat to sharks is uh, fishing for the oil in their liver, which is called squalene. Uh, this is really rich oil that is actually found in a lot of cosmetic products like moisturizers and all kinds of makeup. Uh, so one thing you can do to help sharks is just be aware of what's in your makeup, what's in the stuff you're putting on your skin. 
Another really unfortunate uh, threat to these sharks is just fear. Um, the media has done a lot of fear mongering for these animals. Things like Jaws, Shark Week have unfortunately um, not very accurately displayed the incredible animals that they are and have caused a lot of fear in people. So. Some people don't care about saving sharks um, because they know more about shark attacks than how important they are to the ecosystem. So one thing that you can do to really help these uh, animals is just become educated about them yourself and telling other people about how cool sharks are. There's obviously a fear about shark attacks. Um, and instead of attacks, we should really be saying shark bites because um, these shark bites aren't necessarily predatory, they're more investigative. Uh, this animal is checking you out and unfortunately sometimes it doesn't end so well. But uh, fatalities by shark bites are highly unlikely. In 2019, the Florida Museum's International Shark Attack file reported 64 uh, shark, fat shark caused fatalities worldwide in the whole year. On the other hand, the National Safety Council reported 38,000 uh, car crash related fatalities, which is something that we do every single day, getting in a car and driving a car. So statistically, you are way, way less likely to um, suffer from a shark bite than things like driving a car. As usual, another great thing you can do to help sharks and just about every other animal on the planet and yourself is to shop locally, know where your food is coming from, know where your fish is coming from, and know uh, what bycatch that may pr be producing. It's always best to buy from uh, local small scale fishermen. So again, just educate yourself, teach others, and get excited about sharks because they're really magical to see and um, again they're super important to the well-being and overall health of our oceans. Thanks for joining us for another Wild Side Wednesday. You guys can check us out on Instagram at Wild Side High, that's Wild Side H-I, or Facebook at Wild Side Specialty Tours for more uh, fun facts and ocean related activities and from everyone here the wild side crew stay safe and thanks so much for tuning in